So, any question about the, the last example? It's uh, how long in the discussion part? Uh, once you solve the solution, it is straightforward to get the hyperbolic cosine the cost function as a solution, but the discussion after the solution actually becomes uh, uh, quite long and I skip about something that may not be satisfactory of the discussion because I skip a lot of things. But any question about that? It's kind of an uh, interesting thing if you want to do a demonstration of that. That's kind of interesting also to cut some soup and then this try to get a two wing and see if we pull it apart and whether you get this kind of thing. So, the, maybe just a little bit more. Okay, so the, the discussion because last time we went quickly and said that there are two solutions. But we didn't discuss uh, didn't discuss why there's two solutions and so let's just uh, talk a little bit more. So you have two rings, right? So you have and the, the later specification is that uh, it's located at x zero and minus x zero and the radius is one. Okay, so simplify the thing, right? So and then the the Minimum solution is, is a cost function connecting these two points. Right, there's a cost function, something like that. Okay. And but then you need, need to satisfy a condition. So this is the condition. This is 22.26. So you have a implicit solution, so course transcendental solution uh, equation because uh, the solution for C sub one cannot be expressed in um, in simple function like uh, the square root or whatever that kind of a function. So, so usually when you have a an equation like that, of course you can put it in a computer and, and try to solve it. And but then uh, sometimes it, uh, you can have more understanding using a graphical method. Like, uh, so this is just a cost function. You know the, what the cost function look like. And you try to solve C sub one by uh, a, a, a given X sub zero. So instead of uh, solving C sub one, you might want to solve uh, X zero divided by C sub one. You report like, uh, x0 over c sub 1 on x axis. And the cost function would be just like that. So this is 0. This is a cost function, right? So, and then this one, you move c sub 1 over here. So it's 1 over c sub 1. And then multiply by x0 divided by x0. Right. So it's uh, in terms of this variable x zero divided by c sub one. So this, the cost function, this one, which is on the left hand side, the right hand side is just a linear function. So a strict line that going through zero, right? And then uh, uh, the both sides need to equal. So the strict line need to have intersection with the cost function in order to have a solution. And, but then this, the slope of the straight line on the right hand side depends on one of x zero. If you have x zero that is small, then you have a, a, a slope that is very large. So basically a vertical, a vertical line, so x zero is small. You have a straight line like that, right? So you hit one solution here, which is very small because it's, if the, this slope basically is like almost a straight line, a uh, straight vertical line. But this is uh, one solution because of the cost function. This is exponentially growing. This is a uh, linearly growing. So you, this is out of, out of scale. So somewhere along the line, kind of uh, 
difficult to say, but uh, you know what I'm saying, right? Because uh, somewhere along the line, it should turn around because it's a function. So it's supposedly somewhere it's still, because it's exponentially going in a cost function. So there must be another solution, which is which happened at the uh, very large uh, value. So very large uh, x0 divided by c1. So this is a value where x0 over c sub one is small. So this is c sub one goes to infinity uh, solution. The other solution is uh, because the, it's located at a very large value. This is c sub one going to c0 solution. So, so and this, the solution is uh, the cost function the solution is uh, y equals to c sub one cos x over c sub one. So, so for c sub one that is large, then uh, then this coefficient is very small. So this cos is very shallow. So this co corresponding this corresponding is shallow. Um, Situation like this is a fair street. The, the two rings are very close to each other. X zero is this is two x zero is small. So this this corresponding to the first shell um, cost function. Okay. Then you hit another point. This is corresponding to C sub one going to zero. You see someone going to zero. The the coefficient is large, so the it's a phrase very steep uh, cross function. So this would be corresponding to a function like that. Okay. So, and there are only two, two solutions because uh, if a straight line and the intersection with a, with a straight line to a cross function only intersect at two points. So you can convince yourself that. So there are only two solutions. Okay. So uh, you can see that graphically. And so the, for this case, this, the area of the, of this, the soap frame is closer to the area of two circles because something like that, uh, I mean, the area outside of, because it's so steep, it's almost like a, a kind of a U-shape, right, uh, frame, right? So, so it says call for these two circles, the area but for this solution area, the points to the two, two rings. The, each ring is uh, pi times radius, so it's pi, and then this is uh, so that's going to two pi. Okay, so that that is that. But obviously this, the shallow solution has a much smaller area because it's just covered the uh, area between the two rings. So it's, uh, it's uh, this is whatever, this is two X zero. And then you have this second trend is two pi. So it's four pi X zero, right? So X zero is small for this case. So this is much larger than this one. It's linear, this one is linearly proportional X zero. Okay, so this is a, uh, for, for x0 goes to zero situation. Okay. Now, uh, so this is this, this almost vertical lines, this, this is the case. But then you can see that uh, if x0 getting large, then if you're getting very large, then this slope will be, uh, the slope will be very small. So it's a, almost a vertical, almost a horizontal line. And you see that uh, this line will not have any intersection of the cost function. So there will be no solution after a certain, after a certain value of x sub zero. And there will be a one critical point, one critical x, x sub zero, where you have a straight line just touching the cost function. So it, it means that uh, as x zero increase, the two shoes, the two shoes will merge at one point, one single point. Okay. And uh, so this shallow curve and uh, the deep curve. So at some point, 
two curves with this, exactly the same. So the shallow curve will move to that, move down. The deep curve will move, move up. So you, the two solution convert to just one single solution. Okay. And uh, as this consideration, you see that uh, this deep curve actually is not a minimum. And when we, uh, when we go through this process, the Euler-Lagrange uh, equation actually could give it just uh, extremal condition. So it's extremum, it doesn't differentiate whether it's a uh, maximum or minimum. So in this consideration, obviously the shallow solution will correspond to the minimum, but then the deep solution will co correspond to a maximum because it's, it's, this is much larger than that. And there's actually another minimum that are uh, deformed by this uh, deep curve. Like, so if you have a deep curve like that, you always can deform it more deep, even deeper and deeper and corresponding to this U-shaped film. So there's a, but this, if you deform all the way to here, then the, the area is always exactly two pi, okay? So this is like a discontinuous solution. And there's a name for that. This is uh, in the textbook, uh, say that uh, is uh, called the Goldsmith discontinuous solution. So you always have this area, this, this discontinuous solution that has an area even less than the deep solution. Okay. So we're therefore explaining the, the, the feature in figure 20.6. So you have a deep curve and a shallow curve. And then uh, the shallow, the deep curve all, always have an area greater than this uh, discontinuous solution. But there's one situation that uh, even the shallow curve were given for x0 greater than a certain value is actually greater than this uh, two pi value. But uh, in those situations, the shallow curve still is a local minimum but it's not a global minimum because the global minimum at that, at that case uh, is given by this discontinuous solution. So you have a local minimum. So you perturb this, perturb it uh, with a small value, then it still stay minimum because it's a, it's a local minimum. But if there's a larger perturbation, you can go through a discontinuous uh, process and then move to this discontinuous situation. So the situation is like you pull that uh, two ring too, too, too far apart, then the frame will try, the frame will try to go down and then uh, basically it pop up and then uh, they will be forming two frame on, the, on this way. Okay. I don't know whether expander you actually can see that or I mean, it, well, it, it actually worked that way every time. So you pull the two ring apart slowly, slowly. After a certain point, we pop up and then only have two film covering the two rings. It would be nice to, to do a demonstration like that. But that's a happen at least mathematically, you can describe it that way. Okay, so that uh, give you a more, a little bit more complete discussion of the of situation. Okay. Uh, any question about this example? So this is just a, just a illustration for optimization. If you, this is happened in many optimization problems. After you find a solution is uh, you need to actually uh, analyze the solution more to see whether it's a maximum minimum or uh, whether there's a main global minimum at the like correspond to a boundary boundary value. I think in, in calculus you have some problem like that. Uh, sometimes the maximum is uh, applied not uh, by the like the dfd dx equals a zero condition because there's a sometimes there's a boundary the the, the global maximum or minimum actually happen at the boundary. So, um, 
you might have seen some of these uh, in calculus. But anyway, so uh, that's an example. Now the next section is uh, just presenting some generalization because uh, we, the Euler, Lagrange, uh, equation that we did. Uh, Euler and Lagrange equation that we did uh, is um, the simplest one, right? And we can generalize that to uh, many different directions. Uh, the first one actually in the in the homework problem in last section, which is very trivial, I just write down the answer. So if you have a if you have a integral or functional that integrate this f now just uh, not just depends on y uh, and y sub x actually depends on the second derivatives uh, in addition to the independent variable. Okay, if you do a variation, the Euler Grange equation will have one more term, so. Quite obviously, then uh, so uh, the Euler Lagrange equation for this one you have a partial f partial y and the minus d dx also f partial y sub x. And then you will need one more term for this y second derivative. Okay. And the sign of that would be positive because. Uh, this term you're getting from two integration by part. So you do integration by part two times and you apply the condition that delta y the a and b, delta y at a equals delta y at b equals to zero, as well as uh, delta y sub x a equals delta y sub x. So you need to impose this, this boundary condition. And because you, you need that for the second integration by part, so you change the sign two times and so you get a positive sign here. Okay. And so this is this is the Euler Lagrange equation for this kind of a function or integral. It's okay. So this one is very straightforward. You can you can divide that uh, quite easily. So I won't go further than uh, just write down the answer. Okay. The next one, next generalization is that uh, if you have a, an integral more than just one function, more than just y. So if you have more, uh, this is some more dependent variable. So in your textbook is saying that uh, so you have a, it's a two and you have a function that uh, depends on several variables. So in your textbook is w sub one, w sub two, etc. And also that derivative with respect to x, so you have w one sub x, w sub one x and w two x and, and so on in addition to x. Okay, if you have that uh, more variable, more dependent variable, then the Euler Lagrange equations becomes uh, just generalization for to this case, uh, because uh, each variable will give you a one Euler Lagrange uh, e equation and depends on how many W here, so your, your textbook say, uh, just looking at the so is n variable. You get say up the, the last one is w is n, right? If you have n variable, so each variable have one Euler Lagrange equation. So you have partial f also w i minus d d x partial f partial w i. So x equals to zero. 
for i from one to n. Okay, so now you have n equation for n variables w. So basically, this is a set of n differential equation. And they are all ODE because you only have one independent variable dx. But once you get all this equation right within out, it will be a set of n ODE for this uh, n variable, n w, uh, w sub one to w sub n. Okay, so that is uh, one generalization. You have more variables. Is that okay? So that kind of also trivial because uh, you just apply the same method each time, so if you say consider W sub one, and then you, so you keep varying W sub one and W sub one X and keep everything else fixed, then get you get the Euler-Lagrange equation for the, the I equals to one case. Okay, and keep the pro this process going. So each time you just fix one, one top, well, you fix all the other Ws, just where we want W sub I, then you get this one. Okay, so, so that is not too, too difficult to understand, right? So when you have more independent variable, you have more equation. Okay, so that, that makes sense, right? All right, let me call, write down the other generalization first before we do example, because uh, your textbook kind of give, giving some example for each, each, uh, each case. But let me just write down all the generalization first. So next generalization is uh, when you have more dependence variable. Okay. Let's just write here. So in, in, in this case, uh, it, this J may have a, uh, um, depends on more variables that you have F that depends on U, but U depends on more variable. In that case, uh, I mean, you can have uh, more than one variable. Oh, so X all the way to Z, okay? And then it depends also on the derivative of U with respect to all these independent variables say you have use of x and use of c in addition to x y or under z so and then this integral will be a many integral so you have dx right so you have many different variables okay now you will apply the same process uh, then the generalization obviously is uh, because in the oil of the ground equation, the only, you have one variable, the X coming in just this total derivative. Okay, you have one X, then you have one total derivative. So the generalization for the oil of the ground equation is uh, becomes uh, just getting more terms in, in this, uh, um, this, I mean, all term, all term is the dx term. So the first term is just with respect to the function. So we, only, we still just have one function, so partial f partial u, and then minus for each variable, like uh, for one variable, you have ddx now, because you have more variable, become, this becomes a partial, partial plus x. And then uh, you have partial f, partial u. Uh, this is u sub x. Okay, because this is, this is coming from a integration by parts. Right? When you do a, a partial f, partial uh, with respect to u sub x, then uh, you do an integration by part, then you get uh, you get this term, okay? And 
So, but then you have all, all the other uh, variables. So you have like you know, y, or finally you have a z term, z. Okay. And that equals to zero. Okay, so that is uh, the generalization with more independent variable, but just keeping one uh, one dependent variable. Okay, so uh, this is equation twenty point fifty. Although the I mean, yeah, the textbook have uh, just three variable, but uh, you can generalize that to many more variables. Just for each variable, you add one more term. Okay, so, so that is uh, the other direction to generalize. Of course, uh, finally, you can combine the two, right? You can combine this case with this case, right? So in that case, uh, uh, The textbook has uh, just one simple example for that one. So it's going back to the, the like using the a me mechanical, classical mechanic problem. So you have uh, whatever the F we have now uh, depends on P. Uh, Depending on P and Q, so just P and Q. In your textbook will write with different D. So doesn't matter if you have PX and PY, PZ. So P would be the momentum. And then you have Q would be the, you know, the displacement, generalized displacement is a generalized uh, momentum. And then Q is of X, Q is of Y, Q is of Z. And then uh, J will be equals to this integrating of the x dy dz, right? In that case, of course, uh, you have uh, two two Euler Lagrange equation, each one for one variable. So you have P and Q. So you have two Euler Lagrange equations. So you have uh, the first. So for each one, you have a, a form like that, but uh, with the more variable, you have more terms uh, of the total derivative term. So, so you write it down. So you have partial F partial P minus partial partial X partial F partial P sub X. Like uh, and you have Y and Z. Partial, uh, P sub one minus P plus Z plus F plus P sub C. Okay, so that is uh, for P, and then you write down the same equation for Q. P sub X. Okay, so in this example, you only have two variables, so you have two, only two equations, but uh, you have three independent variables, so you have these three terms. Okay, so that's uh, just combining these two cases. And then you can generalize to many more variables uh, in both independent and dependent variables. And so each, for the number of dependent variable, you have number equation. For number of uh, independent variable, you have these number of numbers of uh, total derivative terms. Of, or those are this total derivative becomes partial derivative in this case. Okay, so, so that's uh, that's how it is, right? And the I'm just just writing it down with the dividing because the derivation will be very similar every time. You're just uh, fixing different different you know, variable at a time. Okay. All right. And this one, uh, 
discussion that uh, applying this kind of language to the classical mechanic problem, but I, I'm sure you, you learned that uh, in classical mechanics, right? Are everyone taking classical mechanics? So you have, you talk about this before? In, in, yeah, yeah, right. So, so it's just nothing but uh, changing F to L. So this becomes a, or this, this is your Lagrangian. And you know the Lagrangian uh, in classical mechanics usually is given by the Hamiltonian minus the potential, right? So basically energy minus, uh, 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 I mean, kinetic energy minus, uh, kinetic energy minus the uh, potential energy. Okay, so, uh, and so I, I don't need to repeat that. So you probably learned those uh, in classical mechanics and how you introduce the uh, uh, Hamiltonian after you have the Lagrangian and all that. Uh, so I don't need to do that. So let's do, uh, see how much time we have. Let's do this geodesic uh, example. It is, it is an illustration that uh, you have more, uh, more variables, okay? So, and I mean, suppose that here in, the, in chapter four, after we, we learn about the uh, uh, covariant derivative, suppose that that would be a good time to introduce a geodesic equation because uh, the two concepts are related to each other. But uh, the text will wait until the, this chapter to talk about that, which is fine because uh, it's introduced uh, another way to talk about geodesic. So basically geodesic, if you are just uh, talking about usual geometrical object like a surface, it's just the curve that connecting two points on the surface, which has the, the, the minimum uh, length connecting the two, two points. Okay, so that is uh, the geodesic. But now we can extend it that to uh, like uh, not just usual three-dimensional or two-dimensional surface, you can extend it to um, general relativity, okay? Where the, the distance now uh, depends on the, the metric, uh, metric tensor and it might not be positive definite also because it can be positive or negative, okay? So the starting point is this, uh, if you connect two points, I think it's point A to point B on a abstract uh, geometry. Okay, and then the, in this space, you have this, uh, this uh, distance between two points, uh, two neighboring points, defined as uh, you have the metric tensor. Your textbook use I and J as the index. So the general uh, coordinate Q, Q sub I and Q sub J, and I J just going to one to the dimension of the space. So for three dimensional, or surface are in three dimensions, so that would be, uh, uh, I mean, it depends on how you parameterize it. So. Uh, I and J would be going from one to three, three dimensional volume, I should say. And for four dimensional space, uh, this, this will go to one to four or zero to three, depends on your convention. Okay. So the, the idea is that uh, you find uh, a extremum over from A to B that is uh, give you the smallest distance between the two, so this is uh, ds, okay. And now, uh, because uh, we want to use uh, the q sub i and q sub j, the num uh, as your number of variables, so this will be corresponding to what we said, the w sub one, the w sub n, so whatever number of, of this uh, q sub i, uh, or q super i, this is, uh, Control variant notation, but uh, it, uh, 
So it's still the going through the number of dimension. So if in this case, uh, you want to parameterize this ds. So, so this ds will be the square root of this one. So it will be the square root of gij equal i dqj. And you want to parameterize it with, uh, so all this, all this q sub i or q sub i will be a function of a parameter u along this curve. So, so there will be a variable u from a to b. I mean, it depends on how you choose it, but um, like in general relativity, one choice would be the so-called proper time. Okay. And uh, you can use that as your parameter. So whatever that U is, you just change all this to a parameter U. So DU, if you multiply DU divided by DU, that becomes a DU. Okay. So, and Q, it is, metric tensor which depends on q okay and so that's a general situation all right so and then you can introduce a, a simplified notation this t dqi tqi du will be your qi dot yeah. this will be qg dot Okay, so this dot is uh, corresponding to DDU. Okay, so that is, so that would be your, uh, your functional to, to minimize. Okay, and you can do that and your text will actually jump to uh, uh, another optimization problem because of due to this square root. Right, so you basically skip a step in the derivation and saying that uh, you actually can minimize another functional that will give you exactly the same Euler-Lagrange equation. So it's just jump a, a step. If you use that, you can get exactly the same equation also, but uh, uh, it just, because this is, there's a square root function. So when you do the substitute into the formula for the Euler-Lagrange equation, you need to, take the derivative with respect to the square root function first. And so you need one more step to combine the square root function with your parameter to get exactly the form. So if you want to skip that, you can, well, instead of varying J, you can vary in A, B, taking away the square root. So you have G and J, so I dot, J dot. Mm -hmm. And that turns out to be proportional to the Lagrangian. Okay, in, uh, you normalize that for a particle. For, uh, I mean, that's uh, uh, in 22.56, although uh, to, to really demonstrate that is a Lagrangian, you take, you, again, you need the more steps to uh, uh, at least transform it to more familiar form. So that uh, for, for general relativity, but uh, if we ignore that, uh, that part of the discussion, you're just saying that the, this variation of this one, this functional uh, will be the same. We'll get exactly the same equation, Euler-Lagrange equation as you're varying this functional. So we'll do that. So this will be, so this will be the F that we have. So, and because we have more variable, more dependent variables, we have more equation. Each equation will be correspond to I equals to a certain, uh, so the index like K. Okay, so the first for, for just the K solution, you have this partial partial Q K of this integram, this is F, so you have G I J, I dot 
And we're using Einstein summation, so it is sum over I. Right, let's see. Let's I get all this mess up. Because uh, we have a dot here and then uh, tends to write it in a subscript, but uh, when you have a summation, you sum over one subscript and one superscript. So that is the, the case. So T I T I T J dot. So that uh, the derivative of the integram with respect to the k displacement q and the minus e d u of Marshall Marshall q sub q dot q k dot okay and then this is uh, g -G. Q dot i, q dot j. That equals to zero. Okay, so that's the oil and Grange equation, and so that will finally give you the uh, so-called geodesic equation. But uh, we want to simplify that uh, a little bit and getting it to a more familiar form. Okay, and. Now we can just take the derivatives. So this is a partial, partial respect to uh, Q, but this is, these are Q dot. So you don't need to take derivative of that. So only take, need to take derivative over this one. Okay, so. so the first term will be just uh, taking out the uh, Q I dot q j dot and that's this j keeping the unity of this g i j with respect to this q k because only only the metric tensor depends on q okay and then this 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 one you have this uh, uh derivative but g Gij doesn't depend on q dot, so we have these two. Okay, so uh, we have minus ddu. So you have two terms. One is with respect to this one, the other with respect to that one. And each time when you take a derivative, you get a, a quantic delta, right? Because uh, only when I equals to K for the first first one, I equals to K, you get one, the other will get zero. And then uh, you have this conical delta and then you sum over, say you do this, you have delta KI and sum over I, right? And uh, uh, we, we're basically uh, changing I equals to K, right? So you have, uh, so you have this first first term. Uh, you have, so you have G. So changing I to K, and then you have just the second term left. Q T dot. Okay, and then you have uh, taken the derivative of that. So that's changing J equals to K. That's G. I K we got I okay now yeah now the, you have two terms but these two terms are it's basically the same because uh, the metric tensor is symmetric. So G J I equals the G I J, right? So this is the, the property of the, uh, the metric tensor. And then the rest is just sum over, sum over J, right? So basically, 
you have a, the say if you change this, change this to it depends on what final form you want. So the final form will be uh, in GIK. So you want to keep this term GIK. So you change this. So you change that to GJK, okay, which is the same because you just flip the index. And then you call this JI because uh, where this is you sum over that anyway, so you can call it I also. So basically, you have two of them, the same thing, right? So you have a, you now you combine the two, so you have QI dot QJ dot QK. Now this derivative, uh, over the, so you, for each term, or actually there's only the two of them, okay? And for each one, you have uh, uh, two terms. One is the uh, derivative over the G, the other is taking derivative of, of the, Q, Q dot, okay. So you have two terms, and the, the G derivative you can use the, use the change rule, say like uh, this G I K becomes a partial G I K and partial uh, because we already have I, so we use J here, and then do the change rule. Then you have D, DQJ, and DU, which get the QJ dot. Okay. And then you have this QI dot here. Okay. And then the next one is G, I, K. Take a derivative of that one, so you get a double dot. Okay, that equals the C law. Okay. <laughs> okay, so all right, that's the that's almost it. So and these two terms are kind of similar, right? You have QIJ dot and QIJ dot. And that's you have uh, this one. So, and you can re rearrange that first. So, put this term first because you have a double derivative over here. So, you have gi k q double dot i and divide by two over the other side. So, uh, so write this term first. Yeah, plus. I'm taking the QI, QJ out. And you have this term, function G, OK, function. And then divide it uh, by two over here, and then you subtract partial G, I, J, partial Q, K, and this one half over here. That equals the zero. Okay. And now you can rearrange this this one again, and get rid of this by um, by contracting the multiply by another uh, uh, the the countervariant metric tensor. So. So you get just QI double dot and plus QI dot QJ dot and you multiply by taking the one half out, multiply by this G K G K J. I mean I, your, your textbook using a 
different uh, you multiply by G K L actually. So you multiply by G K L G K L over the, the whole thing. Okay. And this KL, you contract K, you get delta I and L, so this change to L. Okay. And then uh, this one, you pull, pull the one half out and then uh, keep this one and mod multiply by this metric tensor. Okay. And finally, you, you Recognize that after some rearrangement, so this is not exactly the form of it, but uh, you go back to the chapter four, you identify this one or this one is your uh, uh, Christopher symbol. So you can write down one equation QL double dot plus QI dot QJ dot. And this is uh, gamma I, not uh, L, L, K, and J, I, and J. Okay, so basically, this, this Christopher symbol is this one. Combining it with this one half and G, so this whole thing becomes this Christopher symbol, which is coming from this one, like this one, and this one. Okay, so that is uh, the so called geodesic equation. Okay, so and uh, of course, this is just the equation, you still need to solve it, and usually it depends on the metric tensor. What is the space? And then uh, the equation may or may not be e uh, easy to solve. And this, that's uh, four equation here because the L is also going from, I mean, for, for four dimensional spaces, for four, four equation for whatever dimension, L is going from the number of dimensions. So you have simultaneous equation to solve. So it might not be easy to solve, but at least. Uh, you get the form of the equation, okay? And after this, of course, uh, you are in a general activity course and there's lots of discussion after that. And uh, we won't do that now. Okay. At least this is the outline of uh, one example when you have a uh, integral or the, the functional that depends on more than one dependent variable, then you just go through the same process and get the number of equation out. Okay, so any question about that? All uh, right, a, a, a few minutes left. So we can do one more example or just, uh, just outline an example uh, to illustrate the final point. So you have more than one way, dependent variable and more than one now, uh, in dependent variable, um, what, the, what are the equations that you can solve? You can get all of. So, that's actually not uh, in the example section, actually, at the end of chapter question. So, this is exercise 20.2.10. So, Okay, so it's given you the, the functional, okay? Whatever the functional you want. Now this is uh, a integration over the Lagrangian, actually the Lagrangian density. So this is L, this is, let's, let's just write down one more equation. L and this is a Lagrangian density over a space that is a three dimensional space plus time, the Cartesian coordinate in K. So basically, it's a four dimensional space, and this is in special relativity or 
Okay. And this is the Lagrangian for a elect electromagnetic field and interaction with uh, with uh, charge and current density. So this L is given by your textbook. L is one half. So this is an SI unit, E square, electric field square minus CoD square and minus the interaction between charge density rho and electric potential of phi. So the text is phi. And then current density J dot in the magnetic potential A. Okay, so this is the Lagrangian density. Okay, and for given rho and J, and rho and J can be a function of x, x, y, z, and t. So these can be function of uh, the coordinate. But uh, the in the dependent variable, so x, y, z, and t are the independent variable. The dependent variable will be all this. Uh, Potential, the electric potential rho, the rho, and then the three components of A, so A sub x, A sub y, and A sub z. Okay, so let's go back a little bit. So you have four dependent variable, and then four independent variable. So this is that situation. And now you want to uh, do the variation. What you get out is uh, would be the Maxwell equation with source, the two Maxwell equation with source. The Maxwell equation with those source actually is built in the definition of E and B. So B uh, is given by the vector potential, just the curl of vector potential A. So that is trivial. So and E would be minus square phi minus partial a partial t okay so so all this electric field and magnetic field only depends on the the, the derivatives of these potential doesn't depends on the independent variable okay and and doesn't depends on the Dependence variable directly, also only only the derivatives. Like uh, uh, so, if you write in um, coordinate, uh, I mean uh, in Cartesian coordinate, so the x component will be partial a z partial y. I mean partial partial y minus partial a y. Z. So that's the x component, uh, and the y component would be partial a plus x partial z partial a z y, and the z component will be partial a y partial x minus partial a x. And that is that is B, and A would be just you yeah, again. Uh, you have uh, different components that depends on the derivative of phi and A. Okay, so now we can write down the Euler Lagrange equation for different variables. So you have four in four dependent variables. So you have four equation, but uh, this CA equation you can combine and to a vector equation. So that will be finally you have vector equation for these three components. And one scalar function, scalar equation uh, due to phi. Okay, the electric potential. Now we just go through the process. So uh, consider phi, the phi equation first. All right, so the oil Lagrange equation would be partial L also phi, right? And then minus uh, partial partial X of 
positive L, positive phi sub x, right? And then partial, partial y, partial l, partial phi sub y, partial, partial z, partial l, partial phi sub z, equals zero. Right? So that is uh, for this variable. And then continue, you can do for the other three variables, you have three more equations um, of time. So just uh, write down the, all this duty. Uh, so for the first term, partial L positive phi, like the electric field given by this one doesn't depend on phi directly. Also the magnetic field doesn't depend on phi directly. So only term is this one. So partial L positive phi will give you minus rho. Okay. And now, uh, partial L positive phi x, now phi sub x is coming in through the electric field. Magnetic field doesn't depend on phi and phi x, phi sub x, only this one. So, uh, so E, you have a E sub x, which depends on phi sub x, right? So, uh, and then you have the coefficient in front, so you have partial partial x, and then epsilon c over two, and the partial partial x will give you the, uh, this is e, e square, right? So your e, e x square will have, a, we have this partial, partial partial sub x, right? Like, uh, like you write, writing down so e sub x, you have a uh, also shy, also x, uh, and the x component. You have this a also, but then you're, you're not doing a in here. You have this partial a, x partial t, right? and then your y and z component. So uh, what you have is uh, partial L, you can, I mean, this is E square and you have one half. So you have a uh, partial L, partial X, so you can write in is one half and then epsilon zero and then E dot into the, Partial L, partial phi x, and phi x only happen at the x component. And when you take a derivative of e, e x with your phi x, I, just, I mean, this phi x meaning for partial phi, partial x, this is partial, partial y, this is partial, partial z, because uh, the in, index and derivative is kind of mixed up. Okay, so that one will give you. Uh, the, this one gives us just minus one. And then this is uh, in the X component, right? And likewise, you have this amount of partial partial Y of uh, the same thing. So I'm, 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 doing, I'm doing it to get double, double the, Epsilon c over two. So you have epsilon c over two, e dot uh, minus one in y, and minus partial partial z c over two. Oh, well, I took the derivative. I, I should have a factor of two. Also. So a factor of two, e dot minus one times z. Yes, Okay, everything. Okay, now you can combine everything. So two cancel, this minus one cancel with the minus. And this is E dot X is E X and partial partial E X. And then you combine with partial partial E Y with respect to Y partial E Z with respect to C. So all combining all these will be, this is a plus epsilon zero divergence of E 
combining all three terms, you can get divergence that equals the COO. You get divergence of E equals to rho over epsilon zero. That would be the Gauss law. Okay. So we do a variation for phi, you get this one. And I don't have time to do the rest of so over time. So you do the variation with exactly like x, y, and a x, a sub y, a sub c, you you get the MPS law. Okay, but uh, that's the process. Okay. So the Maxwell equation is combining and just varying this uh, functional and set that into the C. Okay. I have time, but uh, we'll continue and we have the last class on next Monday. Okay, fine. No more questions. All right. See you on Monday.